Hi again, Panther fans, and welcome to this week's Georgia State Sports Update. Dave Cohen joined in studio in this first segment by Georgia State's head baseball coach Greg Frady. Panthers coming off a weekend series in which they took two of three from the Mountaineers of Appalachian State. Coach, welcome to uh, the studio. Welcome to the show this week. And uh, you took two of three from the Mountaineers and had some guys play some outstanding baseball starting right out of the gate on Friday night with your Friday night starter Wayne Wages who just missed a perfect game by one hit late in the, in, in the uh, ninth inning. Well, you know, this is... Uh, uh, my 10th year as head coach here, and without a doubt, I think that was the most perfectly played game uh, in Panthersville since I've been coaching. Wayne was amazing. Um, he never really went to a three ball count uh, in the game. I think that happened two times. Um, his pitch count was very low. We played great defense behind him. He was on point with three pitches, yep. and uh, he just pitched fantastic. Uh, we were all very, very um, behind him, backing him. Every, I think everybody wanted to see a perfect game, but they did get a hit in the ninth, and it shouldn't diminish the fact that he had a complete game, nine in and shutout, that propelled us to a win on Friday night in a very important conference series. And uh, uh, it's only one of four one hitters in the history of the school, so it was a really great night. And it was a game in which Georgia State scored runs early. I think going into the fourth, he had a 6 nothing lead. And certainly that allows him to relax a little bit. And he's, uh, you know, moved into this Friday night starters role because of all the injuries that the pitching staff has uh, sustained. And he's kind of taken ownership of that Friday night spot, hasn't he? Well, he's, he's done such a great job. We've won the last three consecutive Friday nights when Wayne has pitched. And, uh, well, not only is he taking ownership, but as a senior, he's leading the way. Uh, he's setting the the rest of the weekend. You know, if, if you went on Friday, you have two chances to split the next two days and win the series. If you went on Friday and you're lucky enough to win on Saturday, you can sweep the series on Sunday. Friday's such an important part of, of college baseball and getting off to a good start. And, you know, we did take a, a, a bigger lead, a six to nothing lead. However, some younger, maybe inexperienced pitchers would relax and maybe lose their focus in that situation. It seemed uh, Wayne was on point uh, from the beginning all the way to the end. And I think we really played a great defense to support him. I know that every player on the team didn't want to be the one uh, to, to mess that perfect game up. And there was great defensive plays. Ryan Blanton made a great defensive play. Yep. Jack Thompson made several defensive plays at first base. Uh, Jalen Woolard made a great catch in uh, the left field corner and on and on and uh, Joey Roach certainly called a good game. It was a great time uh, Friday night. I truly enjoyed it and it was in Panthersville and it was a full moon and it was just uh, perfect. A tough six to five loss in the uh, Saturday game and then you bounce back in an 11 inning game on Sunday and uh, you know who other than Jared Hood he's done it once or twice already this year a walk off as the game goes to uh, the bottom of the 11th inning and, and you win the ball game 5-4. Well I think our team with some of the the difficulties and adversity that we've had to overcome this year has had to maintain a personality of fighting all the way to the end. Yeah. And it was really great to walk off on Sunday, a, a win that we much needed to keep our dreams alive of going to the conference tournament. And I just continually encouraged the guys to fight hard, and they did. But that win on Sunday, the walk-off, was our fifth walk-off of the year. In a normal season, maybe you see one or two walk-offs in a year. We've won five games in walk-off style, and I, in, in fashion. And I, tr and I truly believe that it's about personality of a team and the committed to keep that effort going and fight uh, all the way to the end and that personality is going to serve us well if we're going to qualify for the conference tournament because we're going to have to fight to the last weekend. One of the newcomers uh, to this ball club, we just talked about him, Jared Hood, who's a local product originally out of uh, Parkview High School. Uh, he's leading the team this year right now, hitting 385, 16 doubles. I, I know you told me you thought that he might be more of a home run hitter. Joey's the one leading with home runs. He's got 11, uh, which ranks him in the top three in the Sunbelt Conference. Uh, but Jared, uh, right now hitting 385, seems seems to really like as we kid around, likes the double. 
He does, and you <laughs> alluded to he. It's his second walk-off hit. He's a clutch guy, number one. Uh, he's a great guy we want at the plate, and maybe the reason he's not hitting home runs is because people don't really want to pitch to him. Yeah. And so he's hitting tough pitches and hitting them to all parts of the field. And uh, Jared's not a fleet of foot kind of player, so when he hits a double, it's hit, and it's hit hard. Um, he's been a real, a, a real godsend to our baseball team this year in the way of having uh, a middle of the order presence. Um, he's, I think, he's third right now, Dave, in the conference in overall batting average, and he's first in doubles. Uh, doing a great job. And finally, before we get to questions for Coach Frady, South Alabama coming into Panthersville this weekend, a big three-game weekend series. How about that Friday night matchup? As you said, Wayne Wages has uh, won his three uh, last three Friday night starts, and he's going to face Kevin Hill Friday night, one of the better pitchers uh, in the Sun Belt out of South Alabama. Well, you know, in my opinion, Kevin Hill is the best pitcher in the Sun Belt, and his numbers back it up, and what he's done backs it up. He's a preseason All-American. He's just a really, really good pitcher. Last year, he had a no-hitter against our team into the ninth inning when Ryan Blanton broke it up. Right. Um, he's a tough guy. But Wayne Wages is a tough guy, too. And the, while South Alabama's pretty dang good, we also got a lot of fight in us, too. And we, I think we're a team to be dealt with in Panthersville. And then South Alabama, which has a great team right now and leading the, the conference with a 16-2 and two mark. The last time they were in Panthersville, we won the series. So I think it's going to make for some really good baseball. I'm excited to play. I think our players will be equally as excited. All right, again, a three-game weekend series coming up Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Georgia State and South Alabama out at the ballpark at Panthersville. Time now for questions for head baseball coach Greg Frady. My name is Omar Hemke. I'm a master's in public health. I had one question. Coach, I know that sometimes high school players commit to your program but then turn pro before arriving on campus. How much does that affect the plans you had for the season? Well, professional baseball and college baseball, uh, it's a love-hate relationship, really. We love for our players to be drafted. We love to see guys get an opportunity to go play professional baseball. And we even really want our guys that we sign in high school to have a chance to be a professional. What we would really love is for them to come to school, mature, develop, and then get drafted and sign a professional contract. Each year that I've been here over the last uh, few years, we've signed high school players and they've been drafted inside pro contracts. It's very hard to replace those guys late in the summer and they can have a really detrimental effect uh, about your, your organization. However, we also have a really good recruiting plan to not recruit too many guys that are going to get drafted and signed because when school starts, if you don't have players walk on campus, then you really don't have a recruiting class. So you've got to find that wonderful, beautiful combination of getting college type level players and professional type players to keep your program growing. Hi, my name is Hanan Ray. I'm a CIS major. Coach, the Sunbelt Conference Championship is being held at Texas State this year. How does the conference championship work and do you have to plan differently than you would a regular season series? You know, the conference tournament every year is played the very next weekend after the final weekend of the regular season. The conference tournament moves from city to city, school to school. Last year it was at Troy, Alabama on the campus of Troy University. This year it'll be in San Marcos, Texas on the campus of Texas State University. So each year the conference tournament changes and like every facility, it plays differently. Troy had an artificial surface, turf. Texas State does not. Texas State's a little bit bigger part than Troy. So you're almost, uh, Going to a conference tournament and a site is the luck of the draw in what kind of team that you have, if you're a power team or a base stealing team, a small ball team. But in San Marcos this year, we're going to do everything we can to get out there. It's a real fight to get in the conference tournament for every team um, in the Sun Belt. It's a very, very competitive league. Uh, CBS rated the league as a top five power league in the nation before the season started, and certainly it's holding its own right now for sure. But we'll do everything we can to prepare to be into the conference tournament without thinking about the conference tournament or how we would pitch until we really get there. And then the biggest adjustment there will be the pitching order and the rotation and the matchups of the team you're going to play. Uh, looking forward to our team qualifying for the tournament, but right now that's still a long way off even though it's four weekends away. Hey coach, my name is Isaac Dennis, I'm a computer science major. Question for you, do you have any switch hitters on your team and what are the rules for switch hitting? Can you start as a righty and change to a lefty while batting? Concerning the switch hitters on our current team, this year we have none. 
I have had switch hitters and a lot of them in the past and they're special players. The ability to hit both right-handed and left-handed requires uh, a lot of talent and a lot of skill, but mostly it requires a lot of hard work because you have to think about it like this. If you're a right-handed hitter, you have the normal workload. You have to absolutely repeat that same workload from the left side, so it requires double work. They need twice the amount of BP, they need twice the amount of everything. Uh, currently, uh, like I said, we don't have any switch hitters. But we are recruiting a guy right there now that not only hits left-handed and hits right-handed, but he also throws left-handed and throws right-handed. He's a very, very, very small percentage unique player in uh, the game of baseball, whether it's professionally or at the amateur level. When you get into the box, as a hitter, you have to declare you're going to hit right-handed or left-handed, and when you get in there, you can't change after that. So a guy that can throw with both hands would have a pretty good advantage against the hitter. All right, Coach, appreciate you coming in. Good answers this week to some, uh, some interesting questions, and good luck the rest of the way and with South Alabama this weekend. Thank you very much. All right, I want to thank Georgia State's head baseball coach, Greg Frady, joining us here in the first segment of the Georgia State Sports Update. Speaking of baseball, our next segment, take us out to the ball game. Jared Oliver takes us out to the ball game as we visit the ballpark at Panthersville. Thanks, David. We're here at the GSU Baseball Complex, and I want you to get out to a game. The GSU Baseball Complex is a state-of-the-art facility and has served as the home of the Panthers since 1986. It is located at 2819 Clifton Road in Decatur at Panthersville, about 15 minutes from the GSU campus. A little known fact, the wall behind me was originally part of the Atlanta Fulton County Stadium where Hank Aaron hit his 715th home run over this wall. That's pretty amazing. The field is natural grass and was laser leveled in 2015 for optimum play. The outfield fences are pro distances with left field at 334 feet, center at 385 feet, and right at 338 feet. And there are seats for over 1,000 fans. Now you know a little bit about the complex. It's a beautiful place to see a game. There is a huge, and I mean a huge, parking lot, and it's free to the public. You can tailgate before, during, and after the game. Usually, parents of the players have tailgate parties each and every Saturday, and everyone is invited. Speaking of food, within one mile of the park on Candler Road, there's every known fast food restaurant and more. You can pick up food before the game and bring it to the lot and have your own tailgate. But if you are a traditionalist, you can always buy food at the park. Hey, I'm here with my man Derek at the concession stand. So tell me, what are some of the good foods that we have here to eat at the concession stand? Well, basically, if you look at our menu, um, we have a variety of hot dogs, hamburger, cheeseburger, sausage, grilled chicken, yeah. one of our specials. Mm -hmm. um, we have fries, one of the big specials, especially today. Yeah. Um, we um, have chips, candies, uh, we have peanuts, we have sunflower seeds, um, variety of Coke products. Um, basically, that's, that's what we have. Yeah. So tell me, how important is the food, what you guys sell to the fans so they can feel comfortable and have that good ballpark food? I mean, I mean we're not really a traditional, you know, um, concession stand, yeah. you know, because we, we give them a variety of things, uh -huh. but we want the, you know, our fans, you know, the people from out of town yeah. are, are from here to enjoy themselves, yeah. man. You know, there's nothing like having a nice hot dog or a nice drink while you're watching yeah. the game. Okay, well tell me, what's your favorite food here? Is it the burgers, is it the fries, the chips, the boiled peanuts? Well, what is man, it? you know, you know, I've had to mention that we do do fish sandwiches, so oh. we, uh, my, that fish sandwich and them french fries is nothing like it, yeah. so that's yeah. one of my favorites. Sounds good, well, sounds good to me, and it's a great time to be here, so thanks, man. Thank you. Beautiful stadium, plenty of parking, great food, what's not to like? So, how much does the game cost? It's free, absolutely free. The only rule is you can't bring outside alcohol or food into the baseball complex. Baseball is known as the grand old game. It started as rounders in 1861 and became a pro sport by 1871. The average game lasts about two and a half hours. The Panthers play a series from Friday through Sunday and usually have a game or two during the week all season. One thing you will notice being at a GSU baseball game is how close you are to the action. Fans really make a difference cheering on their Panthers. Well, first of all, our son plays on the team, so we come out to see him play, but this is a really a family atmosphere. We've gotten close to all of the families and all of the players, 
and the coaches. So it's a really great family fun atmosphere and we get to see some great baseball. Well, it's a beautiful facility. Um, it's nice to come out and enjoy the sun. Uh, the coach is always exciting. You know, I like to see the baseball itself. Uh, we have talented athletes that are out here. Uh, that's a lot of fun. Uh, they make it enjoyable with the music and with all the things that are going on. So it's a, a good afternoon or evening out. You know, one thing about GSU baseball is that there is a sense of family about it. You know, this is a very intimate set, uh, setting. Uh, we're very excited about the new digs that we're going to get when we go to Turner Field. Um, but even beyond that, even beyond the new digs, there's a camaraderie, there's a family atmosphere to the GSU family when it comes to baseball. Check out georgiastatesports.com for the schedule and all the facts about attending a game. So come on, get out to a game. Back to you, Dave. Thanks, Jared. Time now for On the Schedule. What's coming up this week in Georgia State Athletics? On Saturday, April 30th at 2 p.m., Georgia State Baseball hosting South Alabama out at the ballpark at Panthersville. First pitch at 2 p.m. Also on Saturday, the 30th at 6 p.m., women's track and field participating in the Georgia Tech Invitational here in Atlanta. Sunday, May the 1st at 1 o'clock, first pitch, Georgia State Baseball again with South Alabama out at Panthersville. Tuesday, May 3rd at 5 p.m., baseball hosting Alabama A&M out at Panthersville. On Wednesday, May 4, baseball closing out that two-game series with Alabama A&M at Panthersville. First pitch at 4 p.m. And on Friday, May the 6th, Georgia State softball hosting Georgia Southern at the Bob Heck Softball Complex at Panthersville. First pitch at 5 p.m. And that's what's going on this week in Georgia State Athletics. And we're back in the Georgia State Sports Update. Dave Cohen joined in studio now by court volleyball head coach Sally Paul Hamus. And Sally, great to have you here. And, uh, you know, for your uh, volleyball club uh, right now uh, coming off, uh, you know, a fall, se a fall season that uh, maybe didn't go exactly the way you wanted to. But uh, tell me a little bit about spring. And spring was kind of a, you know, a series of games or matches for you to kind of get better as you head into uh, the new season. Yes, it's, it's actually essentially scrimmages that we had and we had six freshmen and one upperclassman, G junior Christina Stinson. And so our freshmen got a ton of playing time, confidence really grew, the, their game grew, um, so it was great. And then our two upperclassmen that had injuries are coming back strong so they should be healthy and ready to go for the fall. A couple of players I want to touch on, uh, you mentioned Christina Stinson, she's going to be a senior, led the team with 287 kills and ranked second in the Sun Belt. Uh, with aces uh, per set, so it, it certainly helps to have a play, player like that coming back. We, it is. She is our team MVP, and she plays six rotations. She does everything for us, and she's probably the nicest person you'll ever meet. And so for two straight years, we've just tried to get her more aggressive, and I think she might be out of a Disney movie. You know, she's <laughs> just the, the sweetest person, but she has grown and developed that killer instinct, so we can't wait to see her out on the court for her senior year. Are you trying to get her to take more of a lead? leadership role as she moves into her senior season? Definitely. Her and Eliza Zachary, who Eliza's coming off an ACL and had a great rehab uh, spring season. Um, Eliza's an all-conference middle, so the two of them are a strong leadership foundation. A couple of freshmen that I uh, want to touch on, uh, Shea Chapman. You talk about impact freshmen, and no matter what sport you're talking about, if when you're talking about freshmen, you want someone that can come in and make a contribution. She had 107 kills, 54 blocks, and ranked second behind uh, Kita Najanaku in that category. Yes, she came in, uh, she touches 10-5. She's very much an athlete, and for her, discipline has been the big thing or theme this spring. And she's done a great job of growing her game and developing some leadership. With Eliza out, she was our only middle this spring. So she got a lot of playing time. Uh, and then we had assistant coach Betsy Smith have to hop in and play for <laughs> us also. So um, Shea got to learn from an all-conference SEC player in Betsy, and, and uh, she had, she's really great 
grown this spring. Real quick, who else freshman-wise, because we mentioned six freshmen that are coming and will now be sophomores, who else will, uh, or are you looking to to commit and make an impact this year? Crystal Lee, she had um, a lot of playing time this uh, fall. She had some injuries, kept her down. She had a fantastic spring, really probably the, the biggest growth on our team um, was Crystal this spring. And then Sarah Renner, our setter, who is also a, a freshman, um, ha has done a great job. We talked a lot about her. She set the ball in the fall. Now she's becoming a setter. That quarterback role of where you see the defense, you know how to set an offense, you can be offensive and attack. So she's really grown in that area. And then we look at uh, Ana Rantala, who is a middle right side. She's done a really nice job this spring growing her game. And then Caitlin Docks, and then our, our new player, Jocelyn Mah Mahag. She is coming in, um, a transfer in January. She made an immediate impact on her defense. All right, and finally, before we get to questions uh, for Sally Paul Hamas, the uh, court volleyball head coach, how's the uh, Sunbelt Conference shaping up? You know, everybody's kind of watching what everybody else is doing. How do you see the Sunbelt shaping up uh, here uh, next go around? Well, with Coastal Carolina coming into the conference, this makes our schedule so much easier and even a higher RPI schedule. So we now have 12 total volleyball teams, six in the east, six in the west, and we have five teams that are, that are in the top 120 in RPI. So it is, it is a very high-level conference. It's no easy matches. It's, it's going to be a dogfight every single weekend. You've got to protect your home court. And so the fall is, is very exciting. Yeah, Coastal Carolina from Conway, South Carolina, uh, the newest incoming member of the Sunbelt Conference. Time now for questions for Sally Paul Hamas. Hi, I'm Jadasia Steele. I'm a psychology major. Coach, I know that you just finished your spring season. What does the spring season entail for volleyball and how many matches do you play? The overview of our spring season, we got actually a lot of time to practice and um, grow our team in a team setting. So, for example, we only had one middle. So, we were allowed four play dates and we got to play at the University of Georgia. They came down to Georgia State and um, had a great crowd. We played Kennesaw State. Um, and then we had players like Shay Chapman, our only middle, got to play all the way around for all of those rotations. So, our six Six freshmen got a ton of playing time and with one junior leading the way it was a great spring for us. My name is Denisha Williams and my major is biology. Coach, what does the upcoming season look like for the team? How many players have you signed and when will you formally begin practice? We will formally begin our fall season on August 8th. That's when report date is for preseason. We expect between 14 and 16 players in the gym and we're Super excited about the fact that we'll have depth for the first time. And so we can challenge for different positions and have good competition in practice. Hi, I'm Mary Sikora and I'm a managerial science major here at Georgia State. Okay, my question for coach is, what do team members do during the summer to continue to work on their games? And are there any pickup volleyball matches during the off season? Summer is such an important time for us in our training and preparation for the fall. So they are, our players are here lifting and conditioning, also playing an open gym. Our new practice facility is a huge addition to our training. So now they have the sports arena and our practice facility um, to train and compete in over the summer. So they can work on individual plus team play. Uh, this also allows if an event is in the sports arena that they have an overflow gym to use. And so so this is huge for our preparation for the fall. All right, Coach, appreciate you coming in. Good answers to uh, some good questions this week, and uh, good luck moving forward. Thank you so much. All right, I want to thank court volleyball coach Sally Paul Hamas joining us here on this segment on the Georgia State Sports Update. And while we're on the subject of volleyball, how about volleyball in the ATL? What's it like to go to school and live and play volleyball at Georgia State University? Our cameras find out as they catch up with members of the Georgia State court volleyball team. Playing for Georgia State just gives you so many opportunities in a diverse city setting. And so growing up in Georgia, you hear a lot about the city, but you don't really know the city until you actually get to live in it. I chose Georgia State because it was close to home, but not only that, it was also a great, great place to step out of my comfort zone. 
because I grew up in a smaller town in Georgia and just experiencing something different was something that I really wanted. I thought I wanted somewhere that was in the middle of nowhere, like I could just do whatever, and I went off and did it, and I realized that's not what I wanted at all. I'm a city girl down deep inside, and I needed that, and coming back here, I just learned so much more about the city here at Georgia State than I knew living right down the street. I'm originally from Gwinnett County. That's about an hour away from Georgia State University. It was very suburban-like, so coming to Georgia State, living in a big city, it was a big change. Playing on a volleyball team with 13 other girls is one of the best experiences ever because you get to have 13 other sisters and family members. We have a very diverse team, and we have girls from all over the country. Downtown is so culturally diverse rather than from where I'm from. Everyone looks the same where I'm from, everyone does the same things. Downtown I see so many different people, they do so many different things and I just get to meet so many great amazing people here at Georgia State. You know Georgia State's down here but you never really realize how much of Georgia State is taken over by the city. Well, Centennial Park is really close, it's definitely within walking distance and there's also the aquarium and the Coke Museum. And there's also a lot of music festivals like Music Midtown and so many different things. I like the Crog Street Market area and Highland Bakery over towards, or Highland Avenue over towards that area. It's just a very cool part of town. We have the dome and they're building the new Falcons Dome right around the corner from us. So that's going to open up a lot of opportunities in Atlanta. I just recently changed my major to exercise science and the new Falcon Stadium, they're doing a rehab therapy center. I'm really excited about the future, just seeing the opportunities here. I enjoyed living in the city a lot more than I thought I was going to. Um, it's, big, it's a big difference, but I love being able to walk everywhere. We walk to the Publix down the street to get our groceries. We walk from every class to and from the gym, and I find it very cool that it's all accessible. I just remember this past summer going to Centennial Park with all of my teammates and I never knew that they do such a big party for the 4th of July here at Centennial Park. So just going there and having fun with all of my teammates and just seeing that that is an opportunity rather than the same thing that my family did every year was great. So my teammates, these 13 great other girls, we're best friends. All of us, all of us are different. Being sisters, we everyone has their problems, everyone has their quarrels, but we all, at the end of the day, still hang out during the weekends. Even on our off time, we're together all the time, and that's a great thing to have as a female athlete. Everyone here and who's on the staff wants to see us to succeed as a person, not just as an athlete, because a lot of times you could see people only care about you for your body and how you're gonna help their school and their name, but they care about us as people, and that was one big reason why I chose Georgia State University. Looks like a great experience living and going to school, playing volleyball here at Georgia State University and doing it all in downtown Atlanta. Time now for GSU Championship Central, the 2016 NCAA Women's Golf Regional Championship. That's on the calendar for May 5 through 7 in Birmingham. They'll play it at the Shoal Creek Country Club. And the 2016 NCAA Beach Volleyball Championship coming up May 6 through the 8th at Gulf Shores, Alabama at the Gulf Shore Public Beach. That'll do it for this week's show. For the entire crew, I'm Dave Cohen. We'll see you right here next week on the Georgia State Sports Update.